Welcome to the channel Witness for Jesus. It's Dawn. Today I have some questions for Jehovah's Witnesses about their Watchtower article dated April 2020 to be studied in June 2020. So if you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses, please, please let me know what you think. And also, if you're not one of Jehovah's Witnesses, you might be interested to hear some of the points Maybe you can also ask Jehovah's Witnesses about this. I was really interested in this article, but there are some things in the article which I don't really know if they make sense enough. And I'd really, really like Jehovah's Witnesses to shed some light on this for me. The article is called, I have called you friends. And it quotes Jesus in John 15, 15, speaking to his disciples. And the footnote to the article reads, the apostles spent some years talking and working with Jesus and they became good friends. Jesus also wants us to be his friends, but we face challenges that the apostles be, did not have to overcome. This article will discuss some of those challenges and provide suggestions on how we can build and maintain a close friendship with Jesus. Okay, so I'm going to summarise the main points made at first in the article, and then I'm going to ask some questions and talk about some scriptures. Before I read the first part, though, I want to ask you, what is friendship? When Jesus mentioned friendship in John 15, 15, what was he referring to? So for most people, we describe someone as a friend who we know well, who's a companion, someone who we spend time with and who supports us and we support them. Let's look at the word that Jesus used in John 15, 15. The word is philos, and um, I'm looking at Strong's Concordance here, look on the screen. This word is closely tied to philio as well, which is one of the words for love. So when Jesus said friend, what was he referring to? This word philos, it means friendly, an associate or beloved. And it says a friend, someone dearly loved, prized in a personal, intimate way, a trusted confidant held dear in a close bond of personal affection. And it also says the root word conveys experiential personal affection. So really, when we look at what Jesus was saying about friendship, he was speaking of an intimate friendship. People who know each other, people who have an intimate knowing through experience. Now, all of this is important as we start to consider this Watchtower article. Starting from paragraph two, the first challenge that the article says we face is that we've not met Jesus personally, because obviously the first century Christians met Jesus, but now we don't meet Jesus physically. The second challenge that the article says in paragraph three is that we are not able to speak to Jesus. When we pray, we direct our thoughts to Jehovah, it says. Um, it says, true, we do pray in Jesus' name, but we do not talk directly to him. In fact, Jesus does not want us to pray to him. Why not? Because prayer is a form of worship and only Jehovah should be worshipped. Even so, we can express our love for Jesus. So that's the second challenge. The third challenge that the article outlines is that Jesus lives in heaven, so we cannot literally spend time with him, but we can still get to know a lot about Jesus without being physically near him. My question for Jehovah's Witnesses in light of this is this. Exactly how can you be a friend of Jesus if you have not met him? You cannot speak to him. And even if you tried to speak to him, he cannot hear you, according to Jehovah's Witness teachings, and you cannot spend time with him. So how can you be a friend of Jesus in these circumstances? Exactly how do you experience your friendship with Jesus? Remember that Jesus used the word philos, which means intimate knowing, experience, and someone who you communicate with and who you know personally. Now, paragraph five says that we must we must be friends with Jesus. We must in order to have a good relationship with Jehovah. Now, I agree we must be friends with Jesus in order to have a good relationship with God, our father. I agree with that. 
The paragraph correctly states that we must come to the Father through Jesus and that nobody can come to the Father except through Jesus. So yeah, that's really important. So I summarised points one to three earlier and I just want to revisit point one. You haven't met Jesus. Well, most human beings have never met Jesus physically, of course. However, I personally do feel that I've met Jesus in a spiritual sense. When I first became a Christian, I was aware very keenly that Jesus is my saviour and I drew close to him. And meeting Jesus includes not only knowing about him from the scriptures, but an inner spiritual change within you, which, first of all, makes you realise you need Jesus as your saviour because you're a sinner and you're made keenly aware of that. And secondly, you begin to know him personally by acknowledging him as Lord and including him now actively in your life. So he's included in your life in a very active way every single day. But okay, yeah, we haven't met him in a physical sense. And not many people can say that Jesus has actually appeared to them either, supernaturally, let's say. So in that sense, yeah, we haven't met him. But let's go to point two. It says the second challenge is that we're not able to speak to Jesus and they're saying that Jesus does not want us to pray with him. Pray to him, sorry. Now, this paragraph is unscriptural in my opinion. Jehovah's Witnesses may want to comment about that. It actually states as fact, as fact that Jesus does not want us to pray to him. But I beg to differ because in John 14, 14, Jesus tells us to ask him things. And this scripture is discussed in this watchtower, so I'm going to look at it. Starting from verse 13, it says, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. That's the ESV version. In this version, it says, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. The New World Translation omits the word me. It says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Just if you ask anything. Now, why? Why does the New World Translation omit the word me? Well, it is true that some manuscripts do not include the word me. However, the oldest manuscripts include the word me here. Watchtower have always said that they use the oldest manuscripts because those are less likely to have been corrupted. Yet in this case, they ignore the majority of manuscripts and exclude the word me. Of course, we know this is because they don't think that prayer to Jesus is permitted. They've literally chosen to translate it differently to support their view that we can't pray to Jesus. But I'm going to link you in the video description to strong evidence that the word me should be included in this verse. But even if the word me is not present, let's look at that. Even if the word me isn't present and it shouldn't be, Jesus still says that he will do it. He will carry it out. He says, I will do it. So think carefully about this. You can't pray to Jesus. You can only pray to the Father, according to the Watchtower. Jesus cannot even hear you. Now, one of my other videos pointed out that the Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus was not given the privilege of hearing prayers. He was not given the privilege. So think about this. You pray to the Father and the Son cannot hear you, but you pray in Jesus' name. Then the Son of God answers your prayers. How can the Son of God answer your prayer if he cannot hear it? Jesus said, I will do it. Jesus was telling the truth. So in order to get around this conundrum, the article says as follows, and I'm going to read from paragraph six. It says, we must have a relationship with Jesus in order for our prayers to be answered. This calls for doing more than simply adding the phrase in Jesus' name to our prayers as a formality. We must recognise how Jehovah uses Jesus in answering our prayers. Jesus told the apostles, whatever you ask in my name, I will do this. Although Jehovah is the one who hears and answers our prayers, he's given Jesus the authority to carry out his decisions. 
Thus, before God answers our prayers, he sees if we've applied the counsel that Jesus gave. Okay. So there's a lot of words here, but basically what they're saying here in a nutshell is that the father tells Jesus what to do. Okay. So let's say, for instance, I ask the father, our God, to strengthen me, let's say. Now, the father hears me, but the son does not. And then the father says to the son, Dawn has asked for some strength. You, you go and do that. OK, I need to ask Jehovah's Witnesses this question. Does this even make any sense to you? Seriously, it does it make sense that Jehovah is constantly telling Jesus what we asked for and sending him to go and do it? This is not simply checking to see if we're following counsel, as the paragraph says. It's suggesting that Jesus literally cannot hear us and he doesn't receive our prayers, but Jehovah does. And then Jehovah tells Jesus what to do. Does this really make sense? You see, Jesus is the head of the body. How is he the head of the body when he cannot hear the body at all? Jesus said, ask me anything in my name and I will do it. There's much more scriptural proof, too, that Jesus can be prayed to and should be prayed to. You'll be familiar with the phrase, for example, call upon the name of, and that in the Hebrew scriptures, it's used exclusively of Jehovah and it relates to prayer. To call upon the name of Jehovah is to come to him in prayer. Now, Genesis 12:8. Uh, shows that said that they built an altar and they called upon the name of Jehovah in prayer. First Chronicles sixteen eight shows that calling upon the name of Jehovah includes praying in thanks to God. And Psalm one hundred and sixteen verse two shows that we can call upon Him and His ear is inclined toward us, meaning God is listening as we call upon Him. So does the Bible say that we call upon the name of Jesus? Yes, it does. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2 says to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. The early church called upon the name of the Lord Jesus. They prayed to Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. This cross-references to Romans 10.13 in a good Bible, where Paul applies the verse in Joel 2.32 to Jesus and tells us to call upon the name of the Lord. And the Lord in that passage contextually is clearly Jesus. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen prayed to Jesus. It says, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He clearly prayed to Jesus and the proper rending, rendering of verse 60 says, Lord, not Jehovah. Check your Greek interlinear for that. First Corinthians 16, 22 also prays to Jesus, as does Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. Hebrews 7, verse 25 explains Jesus' role as intercessor. Jehovah's Witnesses, an intercessor is a person who appeals to another person on your behalf. How can Jesus do that if he can't hear you? He's also our mediator, not just in the covenantal sense, but as a bridge between God and man. See 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. We cannot be friends, especially close friends, in the sense that Jesus said in Scripture, without being able to speak to the person who is our friend. Jehovah's Witnesses, how can you be friends with someone you can't ever talk to? How? Please note, though, that I am not saying we only pray to Jesus. I'm not. Jesus said, address the Father as our Father. I'm not saying that all prayer is directed toward Jesus in the sense that the Father is ever ignored. Our Father is never ignored and the Bible makes it clear that honouring the Son does honour the Father in so many ways. 
Even the name of Jesus, Yehoshua or Yeshua, contains the name Jehovah or Yahweh. His name means Jehovah is salvation. And God has said that Jesus' name is above all names. You can see my other video which discusses the name Jehovah and in particular the name Jehovah's Witnesses. But going back to this article, the Watchtower gives the third challenge now. It says the third challenge is that Jesus lives in heaven so we cannot literally spend time with him but we can still get to know a lot about Jesus without being physically near him. Uh, right so how can you be friends with someone who you cannot spend time with? And you know I beg to differ here about spending time with Jesus. We can spend time with Jesus. Christians know that they're now citizens of God's kingdom today and in a spiritual way we're already seated in heavenly places, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 says, and we have communion with God through Jesus Christ. This communion is not exclusive of Jesus but is entirely with him through the symbols of his body and blood. Communing is joining, we join spiritually with Jesus. Jesus himself said in John 14 verse 23, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. The father and our Lord Jesus Christ, the son of God, make their home with us. If you never speak to Jesus, if you never commune with Jesus, if you never spend time with Jesus, You'll have no idea whatsoever what that means. Jehovah's Witnesses, do you know that the Father and the Son have made their home with you? If not, why not? Could there be something really important? Could there be something important that you're missing in your relationship with Jesus? The article goes on to say it's important to have a friendship with Jesus. But please look at this logically now. It's just not possible to have a friendship with someone who is cut off from you. Jesus, according to the Jehovah's Witnesses, is a created angel who cannot hear your prayers and who you cannot spend time with. He merely carries out the orders of the Father, Jehovah. This type of so-called friendship is not friendship at all. Certainly not the philos type of friendship or the filio type of love that Jesus himself describes. Please listen to Jesus and not a Watchtower magazine, I implore you. How does the article say that we are to be friends of Jesus then? I'm not going to go too much into this, but to summarise. And while I do summarise, ask yourself, does this make sense? Do the following points mean I'm actually friends with Jesus? First point, they say, get to know Jesus through the Bible accounts of him. Well, yes, we value the Bible highly. We're appreciative that we learn so much from the gospel accounts. But yet, if you were to read, for example, just as an example, a biography, let's say Mark Zuckerberg, for instance, Mark Zuckerberg being the founder of Facebook, if we read his entire life story, if we watched a movie about his life story and if we followed him on Facebook, diligently reading everything he posts, would that make you a close friend of Mark Zuckerberg? And no, it wouldn't, except in the Facebook sense of uh, being his friend in the Facebook world. But we all know that that doesn't mean friend. No, we wouldn't actually be friends with that celebrity, would we? We'd only have head knowledge of them and their life and what they did. It's the same with Jesus. You see, atheists know all about Jesus. So do Satanists. People can know all about everything Jesus said and did. It doesn't mean that they're friends of Jesus. It doesn't mean they know him. Not really. People in completely false religions also know all about Jesus's actions and words. So getting to know Jesus through the Bible isn't necessarily the way to be his friend. The article then says um, that following Jesus' example 
makes you his friend. So that's the second point, following his example. Again, that isn't true. <laughs> Back in the 80s, yeah, I am that old as well. <laughs> I am that old. Remem I remember people imitating Michael Jackson a lot. I mean, they'd wear the same clothes, they'd try and get the same look, they'd even learn all of his dance moves, but they were not his friends. <laughs> they were his fans. Imitation of someone does not make you their friend. We should imitate Jesus, of course, who provided us with a perfect example, but that in itself does not make you his friend. How many new ages and witches None of them Christians who say they imitate Jesus. There's so many. They say they love the neighbours themselves. Plenty of people do nice things, such as showing love to others. Even fake Christians. Some people who are fake Christians, they seem to go and preach the good news, but when they're not. the fakes. So imitating, imitating does not make you a friend. So the next two points are totally predictable. And to be honest, I found them a difficult to swallow, <laughs> put it that way. There are Jehovah's Witnesses out, out there thirsting. They're dehydrated because they haven't been given the living water. Think about it. Jehovah's Witnesses are being told all the time about spiritual food, but what about the living water? Who is Jesus? These uh, Jehovah's Witnesses seem to be thirsting for Jesus. And they're told they can be his friend by what? Let's see. This paragraph here, paragraph 12, I think it is, says support Christ's brothers. Jesus views what we do for his anointed brothers as if we were doing it for him. The primary way we support the anointed is by sharing fully in the kingdom preaching and disciple making work that Jesus directed his followers to carry out. Only with the help of other sheep. Can Christ's brothers accomplish the great worldwide preaching campaign now taking place? And if you're of the other sheep, each time you're sharing the work, you show your loving attachment, not only to the anointed, but also to Jesus. And it then goes on to say that we make friends with Jehovah and Jesus by using our financial resources to support the work. To be honest, I'm finding this difficult to read. It says we can contribute to the worldwide work with our finances um, and we're supporting Christ Brothers right now. Come on. Come on. Really? Really? Oh, first of all, the verses in Matthew 25 do not apply to so-called anointed leaders of the Jehovah's Witnesses. It applies to how we treat our Christian brothers in general, all Christian brothers. Secondly, look at this logically. They're telling you that you can be a friend of Jesus by supporting them. Who? The leaders of the Watchtower organisation, the governing body and those considered anointed. How at all does this make you a friend of Jesus? How does going door knocking help you to have an actual personal experiential relationship with Jesus? It doesn't. Plenty folk can go door knocking or whatever, and it doesn't mean that they're even a Christian necessarily. And I really do honestly find this shocking. As a side note, this suggests a loving attachment to the anointed. Well, we love our Christian family, that's right, but I feel this is a little too idolatrous for my liking. Jehovah's Witnesses, do you really think this makes you Jesus' friend? Paragraph 14 goes on. Support the arrangements of the Christian congregation. We strengthen our connection to Jesus as head of the congregation when we cooperate with those who are appointed to care for us. And then it quotes Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. Oh, let's examine these verses in Ephesians Ephesians 4.15 says, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. 
examine this verse, Jehovah's Witnesses. Are we to grow up in every way? How? Into who? Into Jesus, the head. How does the body grow? Because it's joined to Jesus, the head, and we grow into Jesus, working in, in the body, in love. That is nothing to do with an organisation formed in the 19th century. And it's got everything to do with all the individual Christians who have Jesus as their head, their Lord, and they form the body of Christ. But Jehovah's Witnesses are detached, detached from the head. They cannot meet Jesus in any sense. They cannot speak to him, nor can he hear them. They cannot worship him or give him due honour. They cannot spend time with him. And interestingly, they cannot listen to his voice either. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. How can you know Jesus' voice if you never listen to him? Christians have an intimate relationship with Jesus to the glory of God the Father. We know him in a personal and experiential way. Now you might think I'm not telling the truth or that I'm being abstract. Well, I'm not. If you don't know Jesus as your actual friend, Lord, Master, Redeemer, Shepherd, if you don't know his voice, Please speak to a Christian who's born again of the Spirit of God and find out how you can come into this type of relationship with him. Jehovah's Witnesses, you're being denied your beautiful friendship with Jesus. The next paragraph is so, so sad. It says, paragraph 15, Those who are anointed with Holy Spirit have the hope of being with Jesus forever serving as joint heirs in God's kingdom. They will actually be with Christ, see him, speak with him and spend time in his company. Those with the earthly hope will also receive Jesus' love and attention. Even though they will not see Jesus, their bond with him will grow ever stronger as they enjoy the life that Jehovah and Jesus makes possible for them. This says you'll never see Jesus, but it's not scriptural at all. There's no evidence that you won't see him. In fact, Christians look forward to see him, seeing him in the new heaven and new earth. Yep, yep, we do know about the new earth. It's right there in Revelation 21. And we know as Christians that we will see our loving shepherd face to face. Don't let these blessings and this hope be taken from you. Finally, there's a box in this article which says, a balanced view of Jesus' role. Like those in Christendom, the early Bible students mistakenly allowed their love for Jesus to overshadow their relationship with Jehovah. Beginning in 1919, however, they came to see that Jehovah and their relationship with him should be the focus of their worship. We can be thankful that we understand that our affection for Jesus is key to having a relationship with Jehovah. We must attach neither too much nor too little importance to our love for Jesus. This is a strange comment about 1919 because the Watchtower organisation taught that Jesus should be worshipped up to around the 1950s, I believe. Anyway, the last sentence says it all, really, that... We must attach neither too much nor too little importance to our love for Jesus. How is it possible to attach too much importance to our love for Jesus? I mean, wow, how? How, how can you love Jesus too much? Are they saying that we can love Jesus too much? Please know that you can actually have a relationship and a close friendship with Jesus today. This very day. Your salvation is through him, not any organisation. He says, come to me. Please comment on this video if you have questions or comments. If you want to answer the questions that I raised in the video, I'm also on email at witnessforjesus1 at mail.com. If you're patient, I'll reply. Uh, I do get lots of messages, but I try and answer all of them. 
There are lots of Christians who are willing to help you as well, no matter where you are in the world. Facebook has two groups which you might want to join. Um, one's called Jehovah's Witnesses and Christians and the other one's Jehovah's Witnesses and Christian Biblical Discussions. They're particularly for Christians to discuss. So there's plenty of people in those groups who will help you and they regularly help Jehovah's Witnesses. And there are lots of discussions on Bible topics there. And on this channel too, you can go to playlists on this channel, this channel's Witness for Jesus, and you can see a set of videos about Is Jesus God? And then there's another set of videos entitled New Here, which may help you if you've not seen this channel before. So please don't miss out, don't miss out on hearing the voice of your shepherd Jesus. He never said our salvation was via an organisation. So reach out, please. You are not alone. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please subscribe for more videos, interviews, recordings and information on Jehovah's Witnesses. And God bless.